Thank you for listening to Forever Shelfmates. As a small podcast, we rely on word of mouth and ratings to gain new listeners. If you like the show, please be sure to tell your friends, family, landlord, colleagues, anyone who will listen, and leave us a five-star rating on the listening platform of your choice. Thank you, and enjoy the show. Welcome to Forever Shelfmates, everybody. I'm Cheryl, and I love books, and I love to talk about the books that I read, and I'm a librarian, so I have a job where I get to talk about the books that I love to read. I'm here with my co-librarian and BFF, Mirla. Hola. This month, we're talking... Hang on. I had to say hola, because this month, we're talking about the Pura Bell Prix award-winning book. It, it, this one award? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. I've what? done literally no research. You Why do you say that with like such um, scorn? <laughs> this it's one award. Scorn. We're back again with realistic fiction. This time we're talking about Mirla's pick, A Friend Divided by Ernesto Cisneros. Before we get started, our usual warning, we will be spoiling the book. So if you haven't read it and don't want to have the plot ruined for you, pause this episode, run out to your favorite local indie bookstore or a library of some kind and come back after you read it. Don't worry. We'll wait. Shelfmates, shelfmates, reading books is what we do. Shelfmates, shelfmates, and we talk about them too. I'm Cheryl. I like light and fluffy. Meryl, I like dark stuffy. Shelfmates, shelfmates, we're so glad that you are here to hear us. Let's dive in, shall we? Well, this is Mirla's pick, so uh, talk to us about why you picked this book. Okay, well, I picked this book because it won the Pura Bell Prix Award, which is um, in, in 2021, I should point out, so it's very contemporary. The Pura Bell Prix Award is a recognition that is presented to a Latino or Latina author or illustrator, quote unquote, whose work best portrays the Latino cultural experience in a work of literature for children. And well, this book certainly did that. It certainly did that, and I certainly think it is deserving of that award. Agreed. Um, but uh oh, a but. Oh, it's a but. I mean, like it's a, it's a huge. Would you say that this was an upper? It's a bit of a downer. There are moments of humor. Um, but no, the book is absolutely heartbreaking. Right. And when you get to the end, you sort of think, well, it's going to be, this is a book for kids. It's going to be, like, it's going to have a heartwarming ending. Everything is going to be resolved happily. And spoilers, it does not. And that was the best part of the book, in my opinion. It was I the mean, dark it, stuffy because it was real. But let's get into the actual. Oh, let's talk about the let's plot. Let's talk about what okay. happens here. So you've got a kid named Efren Nava. He's in seventh grade. He lives in um, Orange County, California. And he has his ama, his mother, and his, his apa, his father. And um, ama and apa are both, um, they were uh, residents of Mexico, and they are, they entered the country illegally. Um, there's a backstory as to why. Efren has twin brother and sister who are in kindergarten, one of whom has some developmental delays. Um, and they live in this, like, one bedroom or one room apartment it's like really. a studio apartment it's like a studio apartment um, we meet them they have mattresses on the floor I mean they're really they're not well off um, his parents work very hard in different factory settings to provide for the kids and um, meanwhile can I also point yeah. out that while Ama and Appa are undocumented a friend and his brother and sister Max and Mia are U.S. citizens they were born in the United States. Right, they were born in the United States, and that's important. Um, so um, the book opens, and, and you get some sense that uh, there are, that ICE has been conducting raids in the neighborhood, and a friend is aware that um, some of his uh, neighbors are getting deported. So he lives in a constant sense of uh, danger, especially when they hear helicopters or they see ICE officials, he's worried that his, his parents will get deported. And, you know, the book opens, he attends this middle school, you meet his best friend, who's a bit of a character. Um, <laughs> we'll get into him. Um, there's a backstory about um, a friend supporting his best friend David running for school president, and that's kind of 
there's that side story. But the main part of the book is that a friend comes home from school one day and Amma is not there. And what happened? She got deported. And all of a sudden, a friend is thrust into the role of caretaker. He is responsible for his younger siblings. His father has to work a second job in order to try to hire a coyote to get um, Amma back over the border. And it's just, it's overwhelming for him and heartbreaking and very, very raw. Can you do me a favor and explain to our many listeners what a coyote is? Yeah, I should have said coyote, which is a person that you hire to get you across the border. Legally or illegally? Illegally. Okay. Just making sure we're all on the same page. And it's really, really dangerous. And expensive. And expensive. And as we see throughout the book, um, Ama, the first attempt to cross over, fails. The the coyote. Can I say coyote or do I have to call it a coyote? I actually didn't know the... um, the Spanish pronunciation. So I think thank it's you for coyote, sharing. but like the coyote steals her money and steals her identification documents, and so then um, she has to try again, and she needs the money to try again. And so when a friend's father finally raises the money, um, he decides a friend volunteers. This is like a coming of age novel. You see a friend really step up to the responsibility of helping his family. He volunteers, since he is a legal U.S. citizen, he volunteers to cross the border because he can and deliver the money to Amma directly so that she can try to get back to the United States. Um, And he does that successfully, but then at the very end, you see that Amma's attempt to return to the United States fails. And it's heartbreaking. Did you cry? No, but that's... So we'll talk about that this is a book I could only read as a middle grade novel because... When you write for children, there's a different expectation than when you write for adults. If this had been an adult novel, it absolutely would have been bawling at the end. But they leave it with a sense of hopefulness instead of despair. Um, because if I were in that situation, I'd probably be full of despair. And that's it was so it wasn't a happy ending, but it was a heart a heartwarming ending. Like it didn't at the end. Apa realizes that he's put all of this pressure onto a friend to become, to step up and be the caregiver and to do the things that he can't since he's working these jobs. And they come to the realization that a mom may not be able to come back. And so they have to learn to adjust to their new normal. And that gave me a sense of a friend is being seen. He understands his role, but his father also understands his role. And they're trying to figure it out the best they can. And that to me was a happier ending than I believe it probably would have been in an adult novel in which it was like, well, she's never coming back. Right. And life is horrible. And I mean, I'm not saying it's not horrible, right. but I feel like when you write for children, you can't leave them with that. I mean, I, I under, he, he, Ernesto Cisneros was a, is a great author. I really, this is his first book, but it's a, it's amazing. It's very, it's a very powerful book. Um, but he wanted to write the true, authentic experience for dreamer children. That's children who are U.S. citizens with parents who are not here legally. And so it was. It was a great. It was a great portrayal of that. And I just feel like when you write for children, you have to give them hope. You don't want them to feel like life is just terrible all the time, especially when they're escaping into a novel or. Like, it's, it doesn't end happily, but as I said, it, it ends more heartwarming in that they learn how to live with their new reality. Right. And another part of the, the hopefulness at the end is that a friend decides um, there's a whole back and forth about whether or not he's going to support David in his run to become school president. And then at one point, a friend decides that he's going to run to be school president because he wants to support the rights of undocumented um, What's the term? Undocumented workers, undocumented people. Yeah. Um, and he wants to, he, he really has some serious issues that he wants to um, campaign for. And, and he doesn't feel like his best friend, who's a bit of a clown, is going to do any of that. So then he, try, he starts to run against his best friend. And then when Ama doesn't make it back into the United States the second time, a friend is initially so depressed, he decides to give up his... Uh, run to be president but at the end you see that actually he and David they fought about 
the whole election process, but they make amends and then um, David supports a friend and a friend decides that no, in fact, he is going to run to be president to try to make those changes and try to be seen and um, fight for his mom. So there's that also that hopeful element. So I, yeah. I also sort of liked that it had this like side plot of that school, like your life goes on, right? And you have to, like he's still a middle schooler, right? So he has all of the troubles of being a middle schooler um, in terms of friendships, in terms of who to trust with his secrets. Like he has this one teacher and the teacher what the a crazy teacher he like had given up like and there are definitely <laughs> teachers that like he's like oh you just come in and you start writing what's on the board and you don't actually do anything and yeah mr he's garrett very, and he's very strict so like if you don't turn in your homework you get like a demerit if you're late to class you get a demerit and then if you get like two demerits you get detention and a friend gets detention because he's spending so much time taking care of his brother and sister and like trying to make sure they're fed and bathed and clothed and get to sleep but he doesn't have time to do his homework and he's late for school and then he has to skip the detention because he's got to go there's nobody else to go pick up his siblings from school and when he shows up the next day he gets called out by this teacher in class and and he's sort of embarrassed about it, but then after class, the teacher's like, so tell me what's going on, and a friend really struggles with, can I trust this man with my secret? And then he decides that he will trust him, and he tells him, and I think that's a really important part of the book, because it shows children, you know, if you have a teacher, someone you're close to, um, or, an ally. Or, or an ally, somebody that you respect, um, you can divulge really <laughs> important secrets to them if you need, like to help you feel safe. Other th and I think that was his only role in the story, because other than that, like, I, I didn't see his purpose, really. Well, then after that, he sort of became, like, a really good teacher, and I think he sort of, I think he sort of, like, I mean, it happens to the best of us, right? Like, you get into the doldrums of, like, life, and it becomes hard to be exuberant and happy, right? Like, we've been stuck in a pandemic for two years. Like, life has tried to beat us all down, and some people way more than others, and to find that spark of... Um, like imagination and hope and, and excitement about life like he comes back and he like dresses up as George Washington and he decides they're going to go on a field trip to the Museum of Tolerance like he finally finds a spark yeah and which I think he, it's, he it's, found it again because he he was teacher of the year I think yeah. before all this and then when the it was so funny the description of him in the beginning where the class comes in and he's sitting with a giant book of Sudoku and, and he has like his head on his desk and he's like whatever <laughs> it just like, made me laugh because we all know teachers who are like that you are not one of them no that's that's very true and in fact there's a line about the school librarian in the book and i will post it i yes. took a picture i'll post it on the instagram and it's like their school librarian is the only person that he's ever met that is louder than the students and i was like um hi I knew you, uh, just both of us louder than students. I all knew the you time. would like that. But wasn't didn't you like how he portrayed the librarian? She was such an unsung hero of yeah. the of the of the book. And the school library being the place that he felt the safest mm -hmm. and where he felt seen and where he felt like he could yeah. be himself and have stuff. Like when you live in a studio apartment and the studio apartment is essentially like everything is in one room. Your kitchen, your dining room, your living room, your bedroom. I mean, I presume there's a bathroom off to the side. Yeah, well, he'll read. He place. reads in the bathtub. So that's his only place where he can go to get any peace and quiet. And then he has to sort of vacate because, like, people need to brush their teeth and go to the bathroom and take a shower, right? So he only gets a certain amount of time in the bathroom to himself to, to be by himself, usually to read. And so the school library is actually, like, a sanctuary for him because he can sit there and, and escape into books, and it's a place where he can be, he can be alone. Mm -hmm. um, with his thoughts and his books and everything like that. And so that was great. Yeah. I loved that. Because, yeah. I mean, like, I think that's our job as librarians is to make a safe space for, for people who need it. For people so they don't have to read in bathtubs. <laughs> <laughs> I could so relate to locking myself in the bathroom I mean, to I be alone. <laughs> But for different reasons. I mean, I presume <laughs> when you're a parent that that is something that happens. But luckily for me, well, I, I have no kids. Well, so. but sometimes, admit it, do you need to lock yourself in there to get away from Max? No, I never want to be away from Max. Sometimes oh. it's Jonathan I want to get away oh. from. Do you Especially let Max into the bathroom with you? Only when he like comes and like wants to come in and then he's stuck in there till I'm done. <laughs> I'm like, 
would jump up at the door and be like, I want to come in with you, Mommy. And then it's like, Is this fine. Is interesting. You, I mean, dear I listener. watch him pee, right? Right. Poop. Like, so it's only fair. Yeah. <laughs> so he, like, comes in and he, like, looks around. He's like, this place is interesting. He wants out. And I'm like, no, dude. You're stuck in here now. Dear Tough listeners, luck. do you have a pet that follows you religiously into the bathroom? Please I mean, share. <laughs> this goes back to our conversation when we were talking about Throne of Glass, where we're like, not enough bathroom stuff happens in books. Yeah. This book had a lot of bathroom stuff. I mean, not actually like peeing and stuff, but like... Crying in the bathroom. That happens. Mm -hmm. Reading in the bathroom happens. Oh, can we also say, what made this so... It was just so... Uh, what's the word? It was deftly written. It's it, There is a faint twinge, the tiniest little brush of romance but it, it's it's like a flicker and it's so accurate for that age um jennifer huerta is this know-it-all girl and she initially is running for uh to be the school president against david who is a friend's best friend and is this giant clown and um and and people make fun of her because she's a know-it-all but she and a friend have uh, end up meeting each other in the school library and she confides to a friend that she's worried that her mother who is an undocumented I'm saying it the wrong way an undocumented person an undocumented worker um, she's worried that her mother will be deported and they kind of bond over that and then she recommends that that a friend take check out the house on mango street because that was a book that really resonated with her and so they kind of cultivate a relationship that way and a friend thinks to himself hmm you know maybe jennifer would make a better president than david and so there's david, kind of david who's like when i'm president i'm just going to make the vice president do everything well david who's like the first thing i'm going to do is make sure that they serve takis for breakfast and he's 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 a hoot david, david was a very interesting character um I, I don't know whether i liked him or not honestly he was he was a bit of a clown, but he was also very, I mean, I guess it's it's developmentally accurate for middle school kids. A lot of them tend to be very inward focused. That's a nice way of saying self-centered and don't really see the larger world around them. It's just who they are in their developmental stage, right? And he just very much is sort of like me, 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 me. And you're just sitting there and he doesn't know. A friend does not confide in him what's going on in his house that his mother has been deported and that his father's now working it's up like 24 hours a day really and so david has no idea but at the same time he just seems to david says a lot of insensitive things he's not he's not particularly empathetic or compassionate and he doesn't well he except doesn't, for the end well it, he learns yeah. but you know and that's part of his journey but he just like, he drove me nuts. Any scene he was in, I was like, oh, God, do I have to read this? Like, he was all about the flashiness of his clothes and the flashiness of his earring. And he had a switch. And one of his, like, campaign promises was, well, instead of Chromebooks, I'm going to get the school to collect them all. And I'm going to get a switch for everyone. And it was just like, dude, enough. He was a bit extra. <clears throat> to, to, to see both sides, he comes from a broken home. His mother's put away for... Drugs. She's in rehab. Or, yeah, yeah. She's in rehab. He lives with his grandma. He's the only white kid in the school. Um, his dad's not in the picture, and all the dad yeah. does is send money, which is how he has all the flashy clothes and the switch right. and all this stuff, is that that's how his dad is in his life, is he provides money. Right. And and the kids make fun of him because he has a big nose, and they call him the white parrot <laughs> in so Spanish. So can we, can, we, can we stop for just one second? Because I actually... That's usually a Jewish stereotype. A white parrot? No, big nose. White with a big yeah. nose. And so I was like, is that... like?" No, he's I, Irish in the book, though. Is he? Mm -hmm. I don't remember. Yeah. But to me, it was like my little flag got raised. And I was like, Z David's background and his history, I didn't think was mentioned in the book because I was kind of looking for it. Because the second they're like, he's white and he has a big nose. And I'm like, oh, boy. Did we just dip our toe into the anti-Semitic trope? So I'm, I'm glad to hear that somewhere in the book it says he's Irish. I don't think it's said verbatim he's Irish, but the grandmother's last name is very Irish sounding. I don't. So I didn't, he didn't strike me as Jewish, but. Well, I mean, there know. was nothing in it to be that way, but that, right. like, because I have to say, I don't 
recognize, because for such a long time, it's so ingrained that you don't recognize bigoted tropes in books that now I'm ultra, like I've swung the pendulum too far the other way. So now I'm ultra sensitive to it. So I read that and I was like, please no, because this book is so good, but like that, it's so, per these anti-Semitic tropes are so pervasive that you don't even necessarily even realize you're doing mm. it. And this book is so great about expressing how this experience for the Latin community is just, this is what their life is, especially in the undocumented community, right? So it's such a powerful book. And then to find this like one part where you're like, ooh. Yeah. Well, I hope, I hope not. I don't think so. I mean, I'm gonna give him the benefit of the doubt. Um, I should tell you a little bit about him because I did some research on who this guy is, although you probably know already. Um, I, I, as I normally don't do any research. Oh, well, I did not do any research. He is um, a 20 plus year veteran school teacher. He grew up in Santa Ana, Orange County, California. And he, so he grew up there, he was raised there, and now he teaches there. He's taught there for over 20 years. He teaches reading and writing to kids at an intermediate school. Um, and this is his intermediate first. Intermediate is a middle school or is that middle and high school? I think probably a middle school. And this is I his mean, first novel. And so, um, yeah. He definitely understands the middle schooler experience. Yeah. What else can we say about this? Oh, so I think that this book is like the archetype school assigned book. Like, this is completely the type of book that you would get assigned to read in English class. I think it's very important that kids read it. However, I do not think it's the kind of book that kids would pick up off the shelves voluntarily and, you know, read it from cover to cover. So here's the, here's the, um, the question I have, because this is, has long plagued me, because there are books that we have in our library that we purchase because it's important to represent underrepresented communities. And our, and our school community is full of um, a d disenfranchised minority. And, but so it's important to have other books by other authors who are expressing the, the, the lives of other people so you can read outside your perspective. Right, but I find that a lot of these books, whether they're whether they're interesting or not, kids don't check out. They want to go for the stuff that's popular on TikTok. They want to go for the stuff that like their friends are reading, and so a lot of these books don't. But I'm wondering if that's because of the makeup of our community. Like, I wonder if we were in a school where the prominent um, population was. Latino or undocumented? Yeah. yeah. Whether this would be more popular. I'm wondering or, that too. Or whether like reading, like just to me, so the, the, the thing that I love about reading is, especially right now in the middle of like, the world is a freaking scary place. Like this book highlights how scary this world really is for a lot of people. And we've been stuck in a pandemic and politics have become like loud and in your face. And I read as an escape from all that. And so for me, like, I wouldn't pick this book up the off the shelf necessarily because it's too real, right? And I listen to the news and I, and I follow, like, what happens in the world. And this kind of stuff, it just, I mean, it's heartbreaking. And so for me, that reading becomes a way to escape real life. I don't want to read about, I don't want to read about this because I just, life is so hard that when I, when I read, I want to think about the fantasy of what could be, of, of happy things, of, you know, like when we talk about some of the other books we've talked about, right, they're still real, but there is an element of, of fantasy to them, mm -hmm. right? Like that this is, I mean, especially in Fantasy Month, we talk about fantasy <laughs> books or whatever, right? It's, the realistic fiction tends to be one that's harder for me to read, especially when you read the dark stuffy that you like, because it, it talks about the parts of reality that are hard for me to want to escape into. And that's, and that's kind of, that, that's, that's hard for me. So I wonder whether people, and people read for a lot of different reasons, right? People, and also people want to see their lives reflected in what they read. Yeah. Would I read this book if it was a character that reflected 
my community. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe I'd be more excited to take it off the shelf to read it. But this book was just, I mean, I'm very glad I read it. And I, and I, it, it was a very powerful book. And I will say that I liked it. But it's just, it's not what I would have chosen for myself because it is so, it's, it's, it's so real. Yeah. And it's so depressing. <laughs> it's depressing. It is, to, honestly, like this was more depressing than I bargained for. <laughs> Um, when I picked it, I was I was surprised. I was surprised, and but I don't think kids would pick it up voluntarily. I mean, I, there's not enough suspense. I don't think it has the gripping factor that can really hooks kids necessarily. And that's that's where I see it as like this is the quintessential school assigned book. Really important concepts, you know, like helps children learn about the world around them, but it's not necessarily something they would pick up on their own and swallow. Well, I will I will say our library does own this book. And so, right. you know, we have found it to be something that is valuable to add to our collection. Now, that being said, I have a hard time thinking of a student who would actually check it out and be willing to read it, right? Like, because even the kids who are into the dark stuffy, they're more into, like, I feel like the dystopian dark stuffy. And while, like, this and I think that this is real dark stuffy. So I think that's the that's the the difference between like escapism and the realistic fiction is that like their kids were into dark stuff, but what they want is the dark stuff that could never happen. And I feel like the problem is you read something like this, and this happens to people. Like this is an accurate portrayal of this community. It could happen. Now most of our kids, this would not happen to, given the makeup of our school community. But like. I'm reading it and I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, I'm having, like, this is, like, it's heartbreaking to think that this is happening. And then I think about when in life this has happened to other communities, right? Because this definitely has happened to the black community through slavery. It's happened to the Jewish community through pogroms and the Holocaust. This has happened to Asian community. Like, I just started thinking, like, this isn't an individual experience this is the way life is for minority populations in different ways and so like it reflects a reality maybe not today and maybe just in the past but like it reflects a popular it reflects like what life is like for non-white white meaning like white anglo-saxon protestant like the people who who have built this country on certain ideals right and it just it sort of feels like this is a reality for a lot of minorities over time, right? These are things that happen to people. And it's just the more we don't learn about history, the less we are to change it. And it's just so, so sad. There was one part that was ex especially sad, and that was when they were talking about, like, the free-range organic chickens and oh, and the, yeah. e the cage-free eggs. And one of the comments was people in this country care more about their eggs than they do about children because they lock the children in cages when they're separated from their parents who have been deported and they have nowhere to put the, the U.S. citizen children who stay behind, right? They shove them in cages, but they let their chickens roam free so they can have cage-free eggs. Right. That was, I mean, that to me was just utterly heartbreaking. Yeah, especially also the part with the muro, the wall, oh, the yes. border wall. I didn't know that this was a, well, I imagined it was a thing, but I didn't know that there was an official spot called the Muro where families on both sides of the border try to, like, they wait their turn that they can hold hands with their loved ones on the other side of the border, and they just hold hands and cry. Um, oh, God. I know. It Terrible. Was, it, was, it was heartbreaking, <laughs> right? So awful. And then I just, you know, and it, it, it just, it brings to mind, like, all of these things that have happened throughout history, and it's just, like, it's ripped from the headlines clearly from what's happening in the United States today. Right. And it's just devastating yeah. to read. I mean, afterwards, okay. I was just like, man, I need to read some something. I'm, I'm something, with you, light and fluffy. Fantas something yeah. fantastical, whether yeah. it's, um, you know, an actual fantasy that, like, takes you out of the real life or whatever. But, like, I needed something that was yeah. not realistic at all. Yeah, yeah. I actually, I'm, I'm with you. I needed something a little bit more of an upper <laughs> after this. Um, well, let's talk about one of the more colorful characters in the book. Let's talk about Lalo. I was hoping we'd talk about Lalo because Lalo, Lalo was my favorite character because, like, talk about suspense. I was real nervous that Lalo was going to turn out to be, like... 
a bad dude. Yeah. Like, yeah, the suspense factor picked up once Efren went into Tijuana. Yes. That's when it started to pick up. And how believable is Lalo? And who is Lalo? So, so Lalo happens upon Efren after Efren crosses the border to deliver the money to Ama. And he has no idea where he's going. And he's, what, 12, 11, 12. He, he doesn't know what he's doing. And his father has essentially said, like, don't talk to anyone. Just walk to this place. And your mother will be waiting. And he like crosses the border, and of course he's like, I, he well, he looks, needs a taxi. Yeah. Well, he also doesn't know what he's doing. Almost right. sort of comes up to him and is like, "Hey, kid, do you need a ride?" And I'm just like, "Run, Efren, run!" Right? Like, I'm like, this guy's a bad dude, but he turns out to not be a bad dude at all. He really helps a friend, so he gives a friend a ride to. The arch. He's trying to get to an arch. Well, so he's trying to get to like this gas station, which is where a taco stand at a gas station, which is where his mom and mama is supposed to be waiting for him. Um, and I don't remember why, but he like I think he like needs to go to the bathroom, and so he like has Lalo stop somewhere else because then he gets lost in the market while he is walking through. Well, Lalo drops him off and says bye, and then a friend gets lost. This was the unbelievable part: was that a friend gets lost. Some bad guys start to follow him. They chase him, and Lalo shows up to in the nick him. of time to save him. That wasn't believable to me. Like, why would Lalo be there then? Whatever. Well, I mean, I think Lalo definitely understood. Like, this, a friend confides in Lalo when they're in the cab. Like, says, so like, I'm going to find my mom. And eventually he tells him, like, I have money that I'm giving to my mom to cross the board. And I was like, a friend, you never tell anybody you're carrying money. Duh! Right? Like, yeah. Efren is not a seasoned traveler anywhere. Well, but he's also in seventh grade. Like yes, I feel like I know. it was I very know, believable that a seventh grader would be like, do I'm carrying like money to give to my mom to cross the border. I was like, oh. But luckily, Lalo is a really good guy, and he too had been um, undocumented in the U.S. and had been deported, and he's been separated from his daughter for a very long time, and so he understands what a friend is going through and really like kind of takes him under, under his wing right gives him advice drops him saves him later and then he lalo comes with him to meet his mother and they have dinner together and like it just it shows that there are good people in the world like i tend to be the kind of person that like don't speak to strangers because they're all bad right they're not all bad yeah a there are Lalos. There, there are Lalos, Lalos in the world, in the world. Who, are, who will help you and not expect anything. In fact, a friend tries to pay for the cab ride, and Lalo's like, "No, dude, it's it's on me. Yeah, I want to help you." Yeah, and it was very that was heartwarming. That was Lalo was actually my favorite character because yeah. he just he starts out and I think he's going to be evil, and I'm just because I'm that kind of like well, paranoid person. Well, he was person described as, as real scruffy, and he's got all these tattoos on his arm. And, and yeah, isn't that a stereotype that we sort of think that like people who are scruffy and have lots of tattoos are in fact like right. bad guys, and, and, and they're not. Right, and that's actually what the author points out. That well, well the author well, somewhere they write. They write, a friend says, oh, you know, I thought he was going to be really dangerous because he looked this way, and it's a, and I was wrong. And it, what a, you know, imagine how other people must judge him. Yeah. Yeah. So, but Lalo was my, was my favorite yeah. character. And I kind of wish that they, I, I really hope, and so er, Ernesto Cisneros, if you're listening, I would love a book about Lalo's story. Oh, yeah, me too. I would love to read about him being in the U.S. and being deported and, and all of that and about his daughter and, like, make, make a Lalo book. Well, he made a second book. I don't know what it's about, but it didn't look like Lalo was on the cover. <gasps> no, um, Lalo forever. Right. Well, I would also like, I also want some really good Mexican food right now. Because the descriptions of the food in this book are mouthwatering. Oh, yes. So Ama <laughs> is a very good cook, and she refuses to let her children eat school lunches, in part because it would look, it would make them look like they were not, that they had no money, which she does not want that impression. So the kids always show up to school wearing perfectly mended and clean and pressed clothes, so they look very... What's the word? I'm presentable. For? Presentable. They never eat the school lunches. She always makes food for them. But like in the mornings when she's making them sopas at, did I say that right? Yeah, sopas. sopas. Um, for breakfast, I'm like, uh, where can I get one? Yeah, exactly. I, I would like one, please. Yeah, I want the recipes to some of these things. Oh, yes. Ernesto Cisneros, could you please? Publish a cookbook. Yeah. <laughs> or recommend a cookbook that you think portrays accurately Mexican cuisine. Yeah, oh my gosh. Because I feel like there's so now. much like... 
like this is the problem with like ethnic, I say ethnic and I don't really mean ethnic, but like ethnic food in the United States is that like they've tailored it to like white American tastes. Well, and I like, yeah. I want the real yeah. stuff. You like, have to know where to go. You yes. have to know where to go and what to actually. I know somebody who. Now didn't. you're talking and I'm hungry. I know. So thanks I'm for hungry that. too. Ugh. Okay, we have to stop this episode. Because we need to go get some food. We we're we gonna need soap us yeah, we're, right now. We're just going to get Mexican food. So thanks for listening. So long and thanks for all the fish. <laughs> Sorry. That's like my like peace out now. That's all we have for you about A Friend Divided by Ernesto Cisneros. Be sure to check out our next episode when it's released on September 1st. Forever Shelfmates is produced in collaboration with an incredible team of people. Our logo was designed by Mirla Casus and Miriam Goldell. Our theme song was written by Mirla Casus and Noah Sofsky and was performed by Abby Chessman. Our producer is Aaron Adams, Benevolent Overlord, and our show is hosted by Mirla Casus and me, Cheryl Fox Strausberg. That's all we have for you this time. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at the number four Ever Shelfmates for the most up to date news on production. Next time, we will be reading Into Thin Air by John Krakauer. Thank you for listening.